What spiritual disciplines do you practice? We're all familiar with reading our Bibles and prayer, but there's so much more available. In this interview, Blake Courtright guides us through his own journey into discovering ancient Christian disciplines that can help us today, including prayer, fasting, meditation, Bible studies, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. Pulling on the work of Richard Foster, Henri Nouwen, Dallas Willard, and John Eldridge, Courtright shares how these spiritual disciplines can help center us and sanctify us so we can live for God better today. Here now is Interview 19, Spiritual Disciplines with Blake Courtright. Welcome to Restitutio. Thank you for having me, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. Today we're going to talk about some spiritual disciplines. What got you into Christian disciplines when I was a small group leader at Regent University, a uh, life group leader, they called us, our campus ministries team, every year we'd get together at the start of the semester for a training week and cast some vision for the year and, and do some practices. And I think my second year, we did something called, they called it the way of the heart retreat, where we went off by ourselves for an hour to practice solitude, silence, and prayer, which was kind of new to me. I, you know, I'd done things like that, you know, quiet time. But I hadn't been so direct and intentional about it. And it kind of caught my attention at that point. And so I was very curious as to what that experience was. But in college, I didn't really have a lot of time to explore it or to practice it while some of my other friends did. And when I graduated and I started this job and I was living on my own, I drive a lot for my job. So I spent a lot of hours in the car. And I very quickly wore out all of my music playlists. <laughs> <laughs> So I was looking for something to do, and I started listening to some audiobooks that I had already. I listened to Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. I listened to uh, Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. And both of those make great mention of spiritual disciplines, actually, even though neither of the books are explicitly about that. Uh, Wild at Heart is about the masculine soul and about Christian men relating to God as father and, and to one another as brothers, and, and just a very dynamic look at those things. And then Renovation of the Heart is about spiritual formation, which is, it's kind of like the introductory book to spiritual formation. And that's the one by Dallas Willard? Dallas okay. Willard, yeah. And basically in that, his premise is that spiritual formation is about its intention. He says, its aim is to bring every element of our being working from the inside out into harmony with the will of God and the kingdom of God. This is the simple focus. So the practice of doing that lies in spiritual disciplines, but the idea of formation is heart, soul, mind, strength. His point, which I think is brilliant, is that in order to live a kingdom life, you know, he's pulling from scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That your whole being, it's a, it's a holistic view of Christianity where everything is brought into subjection. You don't just show up on Sunday and cue your mind into what's going on. And then you try to will your way through the week. You know, that, that doesn't really work. And I, I found great comfort in that idea. So that was actually a book we had to read for uh, my senior year before we came into campus ministry. It's like, what is this, homework? <laughs> Over the summer, I'm in college. But it was really, really refreshing, you know, this idea of, and he, and he makes it so simple. You know, he's wordy, but he, he breaks down these really complex ideas into simple easy to understand things. And, and it triggered me to go deeper into formation. What is formation? So I asked a bunch of my Christian buddies, said, what, you know, what are some great books I should read? I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to fill my time. I got like 50 recommendations in a day. <laughs> <laughs> I might've been on that list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you gave me a couple. I, I said, Oh man, you asked for it. Where do I start? <laughs> and, um, one that I had remembered one of my good, you know, one of my mentors in college reading was celebration of discipline by Richard Foster. And I thought, hey, that's a, that's a weird title. <laughs> like, why am I going to celebrate uh, discipline? That, that sounds painful. <laughs> and, and B, I thought, well, that's, that should be interesting. And I found his manner totally disarming. And, and uh, he's a Quaker, so he has this very calming way of writing. And he basically says there are three forms of Christian discipline that he is drawing from, from the ancients. And, you know, these are practices that have been in the church for as long as the church has been around. You know, he says there's obviously some that I'm not mentioning, and there are some that I'm mentioning that other people might not. So, you know, it's not a comprehensive list, but it's a good starting point. And from a practical standpoint and just an explainer standpoint, I think celebration of discipline really shaped my view of these things in a way that was healthy, biblical, 
historical and also practical, which was kind of nice to have in one easy to read book. <laughs> All right. So what are the disciplines he mentions? So the inward disciplines of the Christian life are prayer, fasting, meditation, and study. And he differentiates those. And I, I won't go into too much depth, but basically prayer is communication with God. Fasting is abstaining from food or drink or, or a behavior for a period of time for the purpose of focusing on God. Meditation is not the Eastern mysticism of empty your mind and open yourself up to whatever. No, no, no. The Christian practice of meditation is a very filling one. It's one that's rooted in the Hebrew scriptures as well. I meditate on your statutes. It is chewing over uh, scripture. It's chewing over an attribute of God for a focused period of time. I think actually the first time I was introduced to that, I was in your small group and you were talking, it was a book about, I can't remember the name of it, but it was about the ancient practices. Mm -hmm. And I showed up and we did Lectio Divina, which is the divine reading practice of, we'll read through the passage, five verses, read through it again, just to get our bearings, read through it a third time, and find something, a verse or a phrase that stands out, and then read through it a fourth time, zeroing in on that verse or phrase and what it, you know, the whole the whole thing kind of through the lens of that verse or phrase, and then praying, God, what what does it mean? What do you want me to do about it? And that's a very very good example of Christian meditation. Right. So you're you're focusing your mind on Scripture or on something related to God, rather than emptying your mind, or as Deepak. Chopra says, focus on the space between your thoughts. Like, I <laughs> I can't, like, that's, yeah. that doesn't do anything for me, yeah. <laughs> personally. Yeah. It slows uh, your heart rate down a little. Yeah, maybe it slows, <laughs> yeah, it, it just makes me bored, honestly. But, yeah. like, Christian meditation is a very active mental yeah. process. Yeah, it's like, I, I would compare it, the difference of doing deep breathing, which I, I do tend to do, like, some of the physi physiological things, I'll still, you know, deep breathing and sitting up straight and because that does help to calm and those things are great. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you're about to like really dive into this, this morsel of really good meat. <laughs> and you know, like that's how I think of Christian meditation. It's not, uh, it's not eating a salad. You know? <laughs> it's, um, it, you know, salad is crisp and refreshing, but it leaves you hungry. <laughs> but, but, oh, the, but the boy. meat, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, the, the, the fourth inward discipline is study. So, Prayer, fasting, meditation, and study. And study differs because a study would be like, you know, a word study. Like I, when I was in at a Regent, I went to a Calvary Chapel style church where we would literally week by week just go chapter to chapter to chapter through the whole Bible and do this very intensive word study. And that way, you know, you weren't skipping over things you didn't want to do <laughs> and you weren't harping on the verses you always love. Like you're really intentionally moving through the Bible and spending time in a chapter and saying, okay, well, what's the context here? What's the Greek word for this? What does that actually mean? What is Jesus doing here? Right. So you're, you're talking, just to clarify, because yeah. when I hear word study, I'm thinking like you look up, you look up on the internet, all the places <laughs> where a word occurs and you try right. to develop. That's not what you're talking about. You're well, talking about expository, like reading a chapter. Really... I think both can fall into study. Okay. You know, there, it, it's, it's an academic practice. And it's an intellectual practice that feeds right. the mind. So where, where you're working on the text yeah. rather than just reading it to understand it and yeah. maybe have a devotional aspect. You're, yeah. you're really working the text. Yeah. So yeah. study is, is a comprehensive, thoughtful thing. Where meditation is intentional, but it's very zeroed in on a few things. You know, sometimes you just meditate on God is love. God is love. And you try to and you and you dive deeper into that. It's not about going everywhere, trying to understand that intellectually. It's a, it's a heart mentality. Right. Right. So then he has the outward disciplines of okay. simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. So you see he's moving from kind of the mind and the, and the, 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 the soul outward into action. So simplicity meaning you're not, you're not going out trying to fill your house with all these nice things and trying to have the latest fashion trends. He's like, yeah. It's like burn the fashion trends, you know. <laughs> it's like a very Quaker thing to say, but he, but I think it's a great practice of Christian simplicity that we're not trying to be noticed with our flashy stuff, and and that's one of the big criticisms of of mega churches. You know, some of these guys, you know, oh well, you got a seventy million dollar jet, like <laughs> what's that for? You know, yeah. well, I got, I got to get around to all my speaking engagements where I get paid all this money. You know, like, but that's another dialogue. But Christian simplicity is partly a practice for your own soul, but it's also 
as a Christian, it, it shows that what we're about, that we're not about all the wealth and, and materialism. We're about God. Solitude. Which well, I can, back to simplicity just right, for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if your room or your house, your apartment is cluttered yeah. with stuff, it's harder to think. It's hard to have, harder to have peace, yeah. and it's harder to be clean. Yeah. So I, I realize this would typically not fall under a spiritual discipline. Hmm. But I, I kind of appreciate how Foster does put it in yeah. because he is approaching everything from a very holistic perspective. Yes. And so I, I can't resist asking you about minimalism. <laughs> I mean, what <laughs> what's the connection there? I mean, are genuine Christians all minimalists as well? I mean, what if you have two spoons instead right. of just one? Right, right. I mean, what, <laughs> what are we saying here? Yeah, yeah. Where's the line? Oh, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was actually reading it, uh, not from a Christian source, just an article about minimalism. And basically he's saying only the rich can afford to be minimalists. <laughs> you know, like, like really, like if, if you can afford to only have one of everything, that's because you can afford to replace it if it breaks. So I, I'm not saying everyone needs to have like their Instagram, like their house needs to look like an Instagram portfolio where every space is empty except for a Bible and a cup of coffee at the right angle with the light coming through the window, you know, like, <laughs> and, and a fountain pen, although I do write with a fountain pen, but um, that's a requirement, I think. It's the spirit of it, you know, and that's one of the things that he, he gets in here. It's like, you can do all of these things and completely miss the point. <laughs> like you could pray every day, fast for weeks on end, miraculously and <laughs> meditate and study and do all of these disciplines and miss the spirit of them. So the spirit of simplicity is that God is our sufficiency. Okay. Um, and the spirit of simplicity is that we are not in the pursuit of material wealth or riches. Like, like don't build up treasures on earth for yourself is, mm -hmm. is the core of it. But I also think, yeah, the clutter, like, it's not good to have a cluttered space. So I think in that sense, it there, there's a lot of practical aspects to these as well as spiritual. It's not all like superstitious, super spiritual stuff. It's very grounded down to earth. Uh, all right. Practice. Well, let's look at solitude. Talk, talk to us about solitude Ooh, a little solitude. bit. Solitude. <laughs> that now so, solitary confinement is what you do to a prisoner who's naughty. Right. And it's a way of punishing them. So how is this a good thing <laughs> as a Christian discipline? Yeah. Uh, so solitude is a very ancient practice of the church. I mean, it goes back to the prophets. I mean, this is a this is a very, very old thing that Christians do. And there's a very big distinction between solitude and isolation. There can be a tipping point, too, where you're in solitude and it switches to isolation. I think isolation is, which is more what solitary confinement is. Right. You are cut off from other stimulation, from other people, from other interactions, and you are left alone with your thoughts, and you are left alone with your fears, your anxieties, and you stay there in this anxious, lonely, depressive, dark state, that's bad. <laughs> We're not contending for isolation. Self-isolation is a temptation that some of us face. Like I, I know I've struggled with that where I, I get tense in a situation and, and I don't really want to be there, so I just go self-isolate, and that's not healthy. But solitude is a practice of being alone with God. Henri Nouwen says, I love this, he says, solitude is the place of the great struggle and the great encounter, the struggle against the compulsions of the false self and the encounter with the loving God who offers himself as the substance of the new self. And he also says, for the Desert Fathers, solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, it is the place of conversion. It is the place where the old self dies and the new self is born, the place where the emergence of the new man and the new woman occurs. Solitude isn't just a place where you go when you're stressed. It's not your safe space, though there can be a place for that, you know, a place to mentally go to rest. But solitude is about being exposed before God, just you and God, and it's dying to self. Um, Jesus went out in the desert in the mornings before dawn to be with his father. And that's kind of the model that we're following. It's not that, oh, go move into the desert for 40 years and don't have any human contact and stand on top of this post. <laughs> Because there were ascetics who did things like, you know, they, they went really yeah, extreme. Simon the Stylite, I yeah. think, was his name. You know, and, and there are some crazy things that people did. And I don't, I, none of these authors really contend for that, but they're saying in a contemporary context, we could still capture some of the spirit of that by having a place 
to be alone and quiet with God, even if it's a closet or it's, you know, you're in your car on the way to work. It's a time where you're not distracted by the radio, by the television, by the, the hustle and bustle of life, and you are there present before God. And I know for myself, when I practice solitude, you know, sometimes it is restful and it's recuperating, but a lot of times I'm confronted because when you're alone, you have a tendency to have all these things come up that normally, and especially if you're not entertaining yourself. And I, I struggled with this a lot actually early on. And I would close my curtains every once in a while and just sit quietly in the room. I'd turn off my phone. I would turn off the radio. I turn off any distractions and sit quietly and pray. And then I'd be, and then I'd listen to the Lord. And then sometimes he wouldn't always speak, you know, <laughs> and, and you'd have these thoughts and temptations and urges and solitude. It's a discipline for a reason. It's a practice of using by refocusing upon God, you start to subdue those selfish desires by refocusing, you know, I'm there and all of a sudden I have these thoughts pop into my head. Oh, I want to do this next. And then you no, Lord, forgive me. Help me to recenter on you. It's work. I mean, it's not like I'm sitting there, um, you know, like it is a challenge and, and uh, Henri Nouwen calls it the furnace of transformation, which I think is a very apt term because it is really difficult to be alone and quiet for an hour. I just looked up Simon the Stylite <laughs> guy. He was on a pole. He was on a platform on the top of a pole, a pillar, for 37 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he really got into it. Yeah, but, we're uh, not going there. <laughs> that's, that's, not, uh, that's not what you're necessarily advocating. You're, you're talking about, are you talking about doing this on a daily basis or once in a while? Or what are we talking, not 37 years straight No, not pole, 37 right? years straight. There's variations of solitude, too. Like, sometimes you need it in the day. You realize you're starting to become really distracted and unfocused on the Lord. So you go and take a walk and go. I think it's really good to be stationary when you're doing it, though. It helps because you're not distracted by movement and it helps to be somewhere quiet. Uh, sometimes you just can't do that. But I found like sitting in my apartment with the lights off, curtains drawn and just if you're a little uncomfortable, that's probably a good thing because the point is not your comfort and your relaxation. The point is becoming more submitted to God by sitting in that space with him. And, and as these things come up, you push them back down. Like if I'm sitting here with you and I go look at my phone and then I put the phone back down like, and I come back to where we are. I, I think that's a good example, a very simplistic one of solitude though, where your mind brings these things up and you're in with the Lord and then you bring them back, you know, you push them back down. And through that though, you start to find a clarity and you start to be able to hear God more than you could before. And you combine that with meditation or prayer and it's not that it's supposed to be exclusively that because there's also the aspect of silence where you're just listening. But I think that you combine it in these other things. Sometimes maybe it's a weekend. You go camping, you leave the phone at home, and you just sit out and, and rest in God's presence. Um, so it, it depends. I, don't, I, I think each person you'll find it. And, and Foster talks about this really well. He says, you know, you're going to find, if you're a father with four kids, like, you're not going to be able to get alone very often. So maybe it is in the car on the drive to work, you know, maybe that's your solitude, but he does advocate for having a practice of it as you know, daily, because it, all these things start to add depth to your spiritual life and mm -hmm. cultivate a spiritual life. Yeah. I like that to add depth to your spiritual life. Some yeah. of us are spiritually shallow mm -hmm. because we're, we're, we don't take these to the time to yeah. develop this area of our lives. I know that for me, I'm a very production-driven person, so I like to produce. I like to finish things, and when I do, I feel good about myself, and mm -hmm. sitting alone in the dark for however long <laughs> feels like not getting anything done. Yeah. But there is this sense of the discipline of mm -hmm. spirituality and developing this aspect of life. Talk a little bit about these other two, submission yep. and service. So now you're starting to move. So as he goes, he goes from very, very inward, outward, and the next set is the corporate discipline. So you're starting to move outward into interactions with other people. So submission is not only submission to God, but also submission to other people, that you are not trying to dominate the people around you, um, that you submit in obedience to the will of God. And, some, you know, and sometimes that could be a very, very dramatic thing, like God's giving you a call to move or to go do something dramatic and submitting would be to obey and go do that rather than trying to have your own way. But it also is practical with other people submitting 
to the people around you. And service is kind of in that same vein where you're not about yourself. The goal is to honor and serve the other person, to honor and serve the Lord, to honor and serve your community, to get out and do something for someone beside yourself. <laughs> like I think of that as other regard. Yeah. You know, the whole concept mm-hmm. is really well explained in First Corinthians yeah. that uh, rather than seeking your own status, seeking your own personal fulfillment or joy, really focusing on the other whether it's somebody you live with or somebody on the job or just a random stranger that we that we become other focused and you see that in the ministry of Jesus mm. so much i mean he did take time alone he did practice these things yeah. he he sent everyone away and he went up on a mountain he didn't even have a way to get to the other side of the lake yeah. he's just like look this is i i just need some time yeah jesus <laughs> needed some time yeah and he needed to recharge and yet the rest of you know what we see him doing is always serving others healing others feeding others teaching others yeah. walking with the disciples who half the time are knuckleheads yeah. right and we'd be the same way though <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right so Wait, what do you mean um, you need to wash my feet no lord <laughs> <laughs> so um what what about the corporate disciplines so the corporate disciplines are confession worship guidance and celebration. I love that. <laughs> Foster has this phenomenal story where he he called over this this, you know, spiritual this person who he looked up to spiritually, someone who he really like he almost had him in too high a regard, he realized. And the guy knew that. And he called him over to pray for him and because he had something to confess and he needed help. And the guy came in and sat down with him and said, "Well, Richard, would you pray for me first?" And he said, kind of taken aback a little because he's trying to make this big decision. He wants this spiritually mature person to, to guide him. And the guy confesses all his sins <laughs> and asks him to pray for him. <laughs> wow. And, and then at the end of that, you know, he'd kind of destroyed this illusion of spiritual superiority and said, do you still want me to pray for you? He, he got to the root of, at the moment, Foster was thinking this spiritual giant is going to do this thing for me. And it really cut to the root of it because we are all sinners. We all struggle. And it is only by the grace of God that we are changed. What's worship? Is that just going to church on Sunday or what, what's worship? <laughs> so worship is a lifestyle. It's not just music. And I think a lot of us know that. And it's not just the Sunday worship service of going to church and receiving the word, receiving communion, uh, being in that community. It is taking opportunity to worship God in the little things. Um, we talked about this a little, like that idea of, uh, of vocation, that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, as long as your work isn't sin, Right, like you're working towards the glory of God, mm-hmm. and so in that you can be worshiping while you're writing a blog, or while you're editing podcasts, or while I'm working on video, or while someone is taking the mail down the street, or whatever. While you're at the teller at the bank, while you're bending steel, you know, wherever your your work takes you, you have an opportunity to worship in that place and to be thankful to God for what He's done, for the fact that you have a job that you can work that you can find satisfaction in that, and you have an opportunity to to bring him glory even in those moments. That the worship is not just a, a formalized corporate gathering once a week. And and that is a big part of it. I do I think you see that throughout the Old Testament too. They would gather together and worship the Lord with song and with music and instruments. But there's also the aspect of lifestyle worship that we are um, pursuing God in the little details of life. Mm-hmm. And not grumbling or complaining through life, but because I found when I'm worshiping God and I'm doing things, it's a lot harder to grumble and complain. <laughs> I came across this in, I think it was Bach, who who wrote SDG on his compositions, Soli yeah. Deo Gloria, which is like glory to God alone. Mm-hmm. And the idea of that is that God's made Bach to have this gift mm-hmm. for composing music. And so he chooses to do that to the glory of God. You know, what is he doing? What is he really doing? Mm -hmm. He's imagining sounds. He's maybe playing something on a piano, and he's writing, he's drawing notes on a staff, right? That's what he's actually doing. But he's doing it to the glory of God. So that means to me that, as far as I understand it, that means that he's trying to to produce something good. Yeah, He's not like slacking off, oh, this will satisfy him. Um, and or this will be enough to get a paycheck. 
and in his case as well, a lot of times his music would be sung or performed in churches. Yeah. So, so yeah. there was that extra connection in there. Yeah. But I mean, even if it's not by nature holy work, even if it's just secular work, it can be done in a holy way to God's glory. And that doesn't necessarily mean you say, thank you, God, every five minutes. It just It just might mean that you're, you're doing it with a godly attitude, yeah. and you're doing it because God's made you in such a way that you can do this, yeah. whatever it is, in, in a good way. So you're like, you're like a fish in water yeah. doing what God designed you to do, and yeah. you're doing it in relationship to Him. Yeah. And in that sense, it's almost like a secondary worship, like a, yeah. a derivative worship as opposed to like a direct, more mm-hmm. intense form. Yeah. Uh, what about guidance? guidance? So guidance would be, um, again, beautiful about the body of Christ, where I would come to someone else with, you know, I, I have a big decision to make, or I have this, and I seek the wisdom of the pastor or the elder or uh, a brother in the faith. And, you know, it's not that I'm jumping around trying to get all these hundreds of opinions, but to ask somebody who is strong in their faith, who loves God and is sensitive to his movements, I think is, and that's where like Christian counseling, I think is a wonderful thing because people who are struggling with things should, you know, there are aspects of that psychology that are beneficial, especially when melded with the Christian faith where we're inviting God in to heal old wounds. Um, But on a very pragmatic sense, oh, I'm looking at buying a house and I think this might be the one. Will you pray for me? Will you come, you know, you take someone who's a little older, more experienced, come look at it and they know a little more. They have more wisdom um, that God has given them. And so guidance is a very, just a very practical thing in that sense. And what about celebration? And celebration was the one that surprised me the most as a discipline. The idea of it as a discipline kind of yeah, that was shocking. Yeah, that sound like a contradiction. <laughs> um, but he said, you know, we as Christians can get so self-serious about these things and we get so intense and yet God calls us to rejoice in the Lord always. Right? And, and we're told, I mean, look at all the feasts in the old Testament. Mm. Like God loves a good feast, you know, like <laughs> he sure does. He, yeah. and, and there's only one day of fasting and there are all those festivals. Yeah. And I think that that we miss that in, in our contemporary post reformation era. We, we get a little bit too far into the, asceticism and the idea that I, I need to just work hard and, and all pleasure is bad. And I can't, you know, we just get into this like ridiculous notion that God doesn't want us to be happy or enjoy any, <laughs> like, right. and, and I'm not talking about your best life now, but that you gather in community and just celebrate and have fun and, and enjoy, you know, whether it's getting together with a group of friends for dinner or for, you know, just a gathering or a card game or, you know, you're like, you're enjoying the community and you're enjoying God mm-hmm. or, you know, whether it's a big festival and you have balloons and buffets and all the lot and worship band. And, you know, I, I think that celebration brings so much joy into life. And especially at the end of a, of a crucible or a struggle for somebody, when you bring celebration at the, at the end of it, I think it's just satisfying. Mm-hmm. You've struggled through something for so long and then you overcome it. And then there's a, there's a party. I mean, you get that even in the, the parable of the prodigal son. Oh, yeah. He comes back, and the first thing he does, he runs out to him. He puts the ring on his finger, the robe on, and he says, kill the fatted calf. Let's, you know, we need to celebrate. Let's have a party. Yeah. And so what he says to the older son, too, is like, your brother was dead. Now he's alive. Like, we had to celebrate. Yeah. We didn't have a choice. Yeah. And uh, I, th- I think you're right. There is a, t- a tendency within Christianity, especially in the second and third centuries, mm to shy away from anything that is pleasurable or that brings joy and yeah. inherently <laughs> suspect. And that really infiltrates the Catholic Church mm. during the medieval period. However, this is not native to the Hebrew soil of yeah. the scriptures <laughs> because the Hebrews, ha- they don't have any issue with celebrating in general. Like their weddings last a week. Passover has four cups of wine. I mean, there's, there's like... <laughs> The, the Messianic age we find in Isaiah 25 portrayed by a meal with <laughs> rich meat and fine wine. Yeah. I mean, that's the eschaton from a Hebrew perspective. It's not staring into a, a tractor beam glow for all eternity, <laughs> humming in harmony with a thousand people around you, yeah. but like totally intellectually bored and, <laughs> and physically... <laughs> 
you know, stuck in position, yeah. right? That's not that's not the right. biblical mind. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is great celebration. So, the, another question I wanted to ask you was: I think there are probably a lot of ex Catholics or just like folks that are suspicious of hmm. Catholic practices yeah. that would say, Blake, it sounds like you have been sort of like deceived by these undercover Catholics to <laughs> embrace these bizarre practices. Christianity is just, you're saved by faith alone and Christ alone, scripture alone, yada, right, yada, right. yada, all the, so, uh, like, I'll just throw yeah, the, the solos, solos yeah. at you and say, look, if you're doing anything, then right. uh, you're a Catholic and mm-hmm. it's works righteousness and it's it's suspect and questionable. How would you respond to a criticism like that? Yeah. And especially considering the fact that you've already mentioned multiple times, not not just Foster, but in the other sources you cited here, that these people are drawing on the yep. desert fathers and mothers, which you know these are these are the the monks of the third and the fourth century, and the um, uh, contemplatives throughout the Middle Ages were you know like Saint Benedict yep. and. You know, these are the the monasteries, yeah. the convents, and all this. Um, <laughs> shouldn't we like immediately reject anything that is monkish in any way? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question because I definitely had a little bit of that when I was getting interested in a lot of this, especially when I found out like Henri Nouwen was Catholic. But I definitely felt a little bit of that suspicion myself because, you know, what is grace alone? What am I? You know, faith alone, and it still is. That's kind of the beauty of these things. So the disciplines are not about salvation. They're about sanctification, which are, you know, big theological terms or regeneration. But, you know, salvation is the act of Christ saving us from Gehenna, from, from hell and, and pulling us to God. But sanctification is the transformation from a sinner or from somebody who's just been saved and is a new Christian into somebody who is Christ-like. Right. And that's a process. It's not a, you know, people, it's a lifelong journey. And these disciplines are practices to place us in a way where those, where that process is fostered and and nurtured. Right. When it comes to the objection, hey, this is what the monks did, therefore (laughs) we shouldn't do it. How would you respond to that? I would point out that uh, the reason that we have scripture preserved and a lot of things preserved through the middle ages was because of the monastic movement but (laughs) so so we do owe them a debt of gratitude and i'm not saying go out and do the um the extreme asceticism like the one guy on the pole but uh, (laughs) i think there is a lot of depth that we miss and we lose by just discarding them because they were monks and that's extreme asceticism and blah 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 I think we should look at it through a critical eye as we should all of history. But I I think to discard them is the same as to discard the reformers or to discard, you know, the preachers of the 1800s or the 1900s and, or to discard pieces of Christian history, you know, the early, the early churches. I, I think it is a very modern view of the world, this idea that what we know now is better than what they knew, so they must be wrong. And I think that's a very arrogant, <laughs> sorry, right. it's a very um, inaccurate view of history. It's called, uh, C.S. Lewis famously called it chronological snobbery. Yes, and I, and I think that we fall, we fall prey to it in the contemporary evangelical church because we think that, well, we have come so far, you know, we're out of the Catholic, we're post-Catholic, we're post-reformers, you know, we're post, post-modern, whatever, we're, you know, and we just really like the word post. <laughs> we and we're missing this rich tradition of the Christian church that brought life and depth in a way that I think a lot of us lack. And Henri Nouwen's book, Way of the Heart, really hits this. It's like a 90 page book and it's the easiest little read in the world, but it just challenged me to no end because he was saying, and that was in the eighties when he wrote it Hmm. and the way people were thinking then. And I mean, just look how much faster life has gotten. And he said, look what we're missing. Hmm. You know, we're missing this genuine encounter with God. We're missing this depth. Why? And Foster has many of the same questions. Why are we missing this? Mm -hmm. And it's because we have shunned the practices as being too ascetic or too ancient or too whatever. And we're missing out on the life that they bring because as Foster said, it's like, this is 
a way that God has ordained for means of grace, as a way to receive grace, not earning it, but simply it's posturing to right. receive it is the way that I think. Like like a kid comes up and says, can you give me some ice cream or whatever? And he has his hands in his pockets. He's not in a pot. Like, yeah, sure, you can hand it to him. <laughs> you can give it to You know, he's not earning it. He didn't pay for it. You know, you're giving it to the kid. But if he doesn't take his hands out of his pockets, he's not going to be able to partake of the, the I deliciousness. Yeah. <laughs> Great analogy. Yeah, so it, it's 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 not about, oh, now I suddenly am conjuring up the means to achieve this end. It's I'm posturing myself to receive it because he's pouring out blessings right and we miss a lot of it because we aren't in a place to receive it we're mm -hmm. we're so focused on our phones and our busy lifestyle and netflix and our internet and you know whatever else that we are missing grace and i think that's a tragic thing that's happened to the yeah. church you got to recognize that our society will chew you up and spit you out <laughs> if you don't find a way to fight the sort of everyday grind and yeah. the sort of life robbing rat race of our lives. I mean, especially if you're watching a lot of TV or, or movies, because like those are messages that are rewiring your brain mm. to think a certain way. And a lot of it focuses on dissatisfaction. Mm. A lot of advertising in particular yeah. specifically wants you to feel like you don't have enough or to feel that you don't what you have isn't good enough or to somehow inspire within you a desire for more and these disciplines in a sense are ways that we can put the brakes on mm. and sort of attend to our hearts attend to our souls mm. in a godly manner so that we can experience him and really have better flourishing human flourishing yeah. <laughs> um so we're all out of time for this episode but if somebody's intrigued by what you've just been talking about here and they are adventurous enough to pursue this a little further if you could only recommend one book which one would it be oh that's tough i would say in terms of disciplines as a holistic overarching view and, and up, but also that includes the practical side of how to do them. I would say Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. It's an easy read. He's very gentle in his mannerism. He's not trying to push something on you. And I find it to be a very, very, it was a very refreshing book. And it really exposed me to things that I didn't really know were useful practices. And, and I have started, and he also says, you know, don't try and do all 12 at once. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're going from zero or maybe one. So just start to add them over a week and just practice it and write about it and see what works, what doesn't. And I think that that, that approach is very, very helpful. The other one I would say is Way of the Heart by Henry Nouwen, because it is an incredible view of that lifestyle um, and, the, and the transforming power of it. I think they serve different purposes, but those two would be my... <laughs> but if I only had one, it'd be celebration just because of the... Uh, oh, that's fine. Yeah. I'm glad you said two. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much for spending some time here today. Thanks for having me. Well, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot in this conversation, and I'm looking forward to putting it into practice. As for Blake Courtright, if you would like to get more information about him, you can follow him on Twitter, at Blake Courtright. Also, I put in the show notes for this episode a number of the books that Courtright mentioned so that you can get those if, if you want to dig deeper.